On behalf of LTI, I would like to welcome all for the 103rd webinar on what we say, what we mean. The Pragmatics of Speech by Dr. Arpana Jha, Assistant Professor, Department of English, Central University of South Bihar. Well, before we move on to the session, I request Mr. Joseph to play the promo video of LTI. Thank you, sir. Before we start, I have a few announcements for the participants. All the participants are requested to turn off your video and audio throughout the session. The participants are requested not to share any of your personal details, such as contact number, email IDs in the chat box. You are requested to post your questions in the chat box towards the end of the session webinar. Certificate of participation will be issued for the participants attending the entire session. Now it's time to introduce the moderator of the session, Dr. Anandi. Dr. Anandi is a professor and head department of English in Sri Ramakrishna College of Arts and Science for Women, Coimbatore. She has 15 years of teaching experience and 10 years of research experience. Her areas of specialization are Indian literature and Afro-American literature. She has around 18 research publications in journals under UGC, Scopus Index, and also under other renowned journals. She serves as an associate editor of The Dawn, a multidisciplinary journal. Ma'am, now I would like to hand over the session to you, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Reena. I hope I'm audible. Yes, ma'am, you're audible. So I just take this uh, moment of great honor 
uh, to be with his learned academicians and uh, uh, having uh, given this opportunity of being a moderator of the session i really would like to thank uh, elta india uh, for this opportunity uh, so i also take a great privilege to welcome you all the renowned academicians who have joined at this hour with us uh, for the webinar pragmatics of speech and i also take a great privilege in introducing our resource person of today dr arpana ja madam is currently the assistant professor of the department of english of central university of south bihar uh, gaya and madam has got an experience of more than 11 years of teaching and uh, at institutions such as the central university of rajasthan center for La linguistic and linguistic empowerment cell at jawaharlal nehru university delhi and c college of engineering haryana and she has a phd degree in linguistics from jawaharlal nehru university she also holds a twin masters degree in linguistics and english so before her engagement in the field of teaching madam has worked with the industry such as ibm daksh and has copy edited the journal of i triple e tata macro health springer and elsevio she also holds certification of proficiency in english from the national english language testing service wiso her areas of specialization are communication skills and curriculum material design for english for specific purpose her uh, areas of interest and current research include pragmatics and discourse analysis post colonial literature aesthetics of films and disability studies so today uh, we move on to a very uh, important and a very interesting session on the pragmatics of uh, speech so pragmatic language refers to the social language skills that which we use in our uh, daily interaction with others that is it includes how we say it a non verbal communication like eye contact facial expression body language etc and how appropriate our interaction our uh, interactions are with the given situation so this is very vital for communicating our personal thoughts ideas and feelings so i really think that this is actually the need of the heart so i hand over the session here to madam arpana ja uh they were delegating the others on uh, important aspects of the pragmatic madam the session is yours now ma'am uh, sorry, sorry have to unmute ma'am you have to unmute Uh, yes. Thank you. Thank I guess it's I'm audible now. Yes. Yes, ma'am. You're audible. Thank you. Thank you so much, Doctor Anandi. And uh, I take this opportunity to express my sincere gratitude to the Eltai uh, Association for giving me this opportunity to speak on pragmatics, on which I am currently working on. And uh, today, I thought of uh, presenting. Uh, on a topic which says what we say is what we mean and what we mean so it's actually a, something that i'll discuss about pragmatics of speech uh, before i move on to it let me start uh, presenting just wait for a second is the screen visible my powerpoint yes yes yes, yes. yes. Okay. i would like to begin uh, today's discussion with a passage uh, that i have taken from uh, through the looking glass and this is a uh, uh, conversation which happens between humpty dumpty and alice in wonderland now uh, humpty dumpty says there's glory for you and alice replies i don't know what you mean by glory of course you don't till i tell you i meant there's a nice knockdown argument for you now alice replies by saying that glory doesn't mean a nice knockdown argument and humpty's response is very important he says when i use a word it means just what i choose it to mean neither more nor less now alice is somewhat you know festered 
she says the question is whether you can make words mean so many different things and Hamdi replies the question is which is to be master that's all now I why I wanted to begin this uh, discussion with this passage is that you know it might sound that Hamdi is a bit funny or a bit absurd if people really talked that way communication would be impossible right Perhaps the most important fact about word meanings is that they must be shared by, a, by the speech community. Speakers of a given language must agree at least for the most of the time about what each words mean. Now, while it is true that words must have these agreed upon meanings, word meanings can be stretched or extended in several ways and without losing comprehension on the part of the hearer and the conventions for these extended meanings must also be shared by the speech community so what i wanted to say is that you know there seems to be a rule rules even for bending the rules so the speakers of a given language must agree at least about what each words means as i have said and the conventions for these extended meanings must also be shared within the speech community. Now, when we are discussing word meanings, semantics is the start, uh, field which comes into play. Semantics is often defined as the study of meaning, where it is uh, more accurate to define it as the study of relationship between linguistic form and meaning. And this relationship is clearly rule governed, just as other aspects of linguistic structures are. Now, all of these components that we have, uh, when we are as language learners, we acquire a vocabulary, a lexicon, together with a set of rules to combine various vocabulary items into well formed sentences, what we know as syntax. Now, the same logic forces us to recognize that language learners must acquire not only meanings of vocabulary items, but also a set of rules for interpreting the expressions that are formed when these items are combined. All of these components must be shared by the speech community in order for the linguistic communication to be possible. So when we study semantics, we are trying to understand this shared system of rules that allows hearers to correctly interpret what speakers intend to communicate. But when we look at pragmatics, there are two ways in which we can explore the meaning in human language. One is semantics. The other one is through pragmatics. Now, pragmatics is concerned with those aspects of meaning that depends on or derive from the way in which words and sentences are used. Now, uh, here I would like to uh, ref, uh, mention another episode uh, of Mark Twain. Now, he has described a certain person as, uh, within quotes, a good man in the worst sense of the word. Now, here the humor of this remark in Mark Twain's quotes lies partly in the unexpected use of the word good with something which is very close to its meaning, actually almost the opposite of its normal meaning. So here, the basic meaning of good would be uh, its semantic content. The negative meaning which Twain manages to convey is the result of pragmatic interfer inferences that is triggered by the peculiar way in which he uses the word. Now here, what we are interested uh, in the meaning in three different ways. We can study meaning at three different levels as word meaning, sentence meaning, and utterance meaning. Now word meaning and sentence meaning, the first two units, linguistic units that we have are uh, familiar with the audience. So in order to understand this third level, which is the utterance meaning, we have to distinguish between what are sentences and utterances first. So a sentence is considered to be a linguistic expression a full, uh, a well-formed string of words, whereas the utterances is a speech event by a particular speaker in a specific context. We'll come back to speech event uh, again later on. 
the sentence meaning is the semantic content of the sentence that means the meaning which derives from the words themselves regardless of the context but utterance is always associated within the context utterance meanings involve semantic content as well as any pragmatic meaning created in a specific in way in which a sentence is used uh, cruz has a uh, very uh, wisely remarked that utterance meaning is the totality of what the speaker intends to convey by making an utterance. It is this intent which is important for us, which we will later on discuss. Before we move on to the intended meaning, there's something that we should uh, remember. The relation that exists between form and meaning. For most words, we know that the relation between form, that is the phonetic shape of the word, and its meaning is arbitrary. Now, this is not always the case. There are some exceptions, as in onomatopoeic words, whose uh, you know intended um, uh, forms are intended to be almost like the imitations of the sounds themselves. But even in these cases, the phonetic shape of the word is partly conventional. Now, the relation between the form of a sentence. Now, when we say the form of a sentence or any multimodal expression and its meaning is generally not arbitrary. It is compositional in nature. So there is this principle of compositionality which function, functions. Now, this principle uh, actually is that the meaning of an expression is predictable from the meaning of the word it contains as well as the way in which these words are combined and idiomatic phrases are uh, exceptions to the this um, rule of compositionality now for utterances you know for utterances uh, the meaning uh, the relation is neither arbitrary nor strictly speaking composition it is derivable from the meaning of the sentences as well as the context in which various pragmatic principles apply now uh, moving on to you know when we say we mean something and meaning when we mean something we want something to be done therefore saying meaning and doing are related now today's discussion revolves around these aspects you know what did the speaker say which is actually the semantic content what did the speaker intend to communicate, which is implicator? And what is the speaker trying to do by uh, the, the speech, which is no, uh, almost uh, uh, we refer to as speech act. So today's discussion revolves around utterance meaning, especially focusing on meaning that are not explicitly stated, but those that are implied. Right now, here this discussion will exclude the meaning that comes out of body language, about the manner of addressing, dressing, facial expressions, gestures. Although these can often convey a great deal of information, we also exclude sign languages because facial expressions and gestures do have linguistic meaning. Right. So we, with this saying that you know implicator what did the speaker intend to communicate would be the focus of our discussion today now this implicator has been discussed very widely by the philosopher hp grice who coined this term in 1975. one example i would like to quote from his book is i'm out of petrol and there's the second uh, the speaker says there's a garage garage or a service station around the corner right this does not seem to be uh, the direct response to the statement that the speaker mentions but something the speaker is suggesting here or implying with an utterance here even though it is not literally expressed and what is not literally expressed here is that you can get petrol from the service station next by uh, which is around the corner right so here uh, what is said or what is implicated takes into account the context and it cannot be arbitrary. It is a 
cooperative activity. And once we talk about cooperation, what do we mean by cooperation is that, you know, the speakers or, or the uh, participants who are involved in the conversation agree that they are going to have an, uh, a discussion or a conversation or an exchange. They are going to engage in a conversation. So this cooperative principle was uh, given by Grice in 1975, and I quote it. He says, make your conversational contribution such as is required at the stage at, at which it occurs by the accepted purpose or direction of the talk exchange in which you are engaged. So cooperation comes at the stage when you, uh, you know, you may not give a direct response. It may be implied taking context into account. But yes, you agree to give a response to the conversation and want the conversation to progress further. Now, with this cooperative principle, uh, Grice came up with four maxims of conversation. Now, the connection between what is said and what is uh, implicated is rule governed, as I have said, to a significant, very significant degree. Otherwise, the speaker could not expect the hearer to reliably understand the intended meaning. Now, Grice was not only the first scholar to describe the characteristic features of implicators, but he was also the first, but he was the first to propose a systematic explanation of how they work. Now, his lecture series at Harvard University that he gave, he gave the foundation of his anal or analysis of implicators. Now, this uh, his lectures triggered an explosion of interest in research on this area of topic, which is your implicature in pragmatics. Now, Grice's fundamental insight comes from the cooperative principle. So in order to carry an intelligible conversation, each party must assume that other is what other is trying to participate in a meaningful way. This is true even if the speakers involved are debating or quarreling. They are still trying to carry on a conversation. And there, uh, Grice proposed that there are certain default assumptions about how conversation works. And he stated uh, these uh, in the form of general cooperative principle and some of the maxims, sub-principles, we can say, which, is which he labeled as maxims of conversation. And he comes up with four maxims maxims of quality, quantity, relation, or relevance, and manner. Now, the maxim of quality. Here I have uh, taken ex an example, like the capital of India is New Delhi. Now, in a in, uh, maxim of quality, what Grice says that we should try to make contribution that is true. That means to say that you do not say what you believe to be false, and we do not say for which you lack inad um, adequate evidence. And here, it's a fact that the capital of India is New Delhi, right? So it's uh, 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 there's no falsification here in this example. So the statement follows this uh, maxim of quality. The maximum of quantity that he proposes is where he says that you should try to make a contribution or uh, uh, contribution as informative as it is required from the current purpose of the exchange. Right. So we do not have to make contribution or, or provide information which is more informative than is required. That is equally uh, should be avoided. Now, here I've given an example. That speaker A says, do you think Lucky is dating someone? And the speaker B says, uh, sorry, speaker A says, do you know if Rohit passed his exams? And the B says, yes, uh, I do. he got an A. Yes? Ma'am, I think you can continue, ma'am. Please, there was uh, somebody who is unmuted okay. unknowingly. Please, please be Okay, uh, participants, I really request you all to uh, switch off your videos, please, and unmute. Sorry, mute. Thank you. So this is a uh, you know uh, almost a, a perfect kind of a situation that uh, uh, Grice says that in you, whatever information you give in your conversation has to be just perfect in the sense not more, not less. 
but this is actually what doesn't happen we'll come to that again so here lucky uh, uh, rohit someone asked rohit passed his exams and someone knows that yes i do and this person speaker b he says that he got an a valid reason for saying why he says that he has passed his example so enough of information to prove that he knows that rohit passed his exam has been given by the speaker b here now in the third maxim of relation or uh, relevance uh, Bryce says that, you know, whatever your contribution to the conversation is, has to be relevant to the discussion which is going on. And do you think Lucky is dating someone? And uh, the B speaker B says, well, he goes to Noida most weekends, right? Now, he gives the reason, you know, that, okay, because he goes to Noida on weekends, it is uh, uh, presumed that, yes, Lucky is dating someone. Now, the maxim of manner, uh, what Grice states is that, you know, we have to be very perspicuous and avoid ob obscurity of expressions and avoid any sort of ambiguity. Uh, we should be brief uh, and not extend our information too much and drag on and be orderly in some manner or the other. Here, the example I have taken is, it's possible the plane will be late. Right. This is a positive way of saying that the plane will be late. I can make the statement more convoluted by saying that it's not possible that the plane will be late. Double negatives generally, you know, become more difficult for comprehension rather than the positive statements. So these are the four uh, maxims of quality, quantity, uh, relevance and manner that along with the cooperative principle that Bryce says that holds for conversation. We should recognize that no speaker ever produces all their you know, utterances in direct accordance with the maxims that Grice has mentioned. And uh, even Grice understood that many speakers consistently break or transgress one or more of these maxims when they speak. And they do so very purposefully in order to communicate elocutionary meaning beyond what they actually say by their locution. So when a speaker appears to violate one of the maxims, a pragmatic inference is created. But this is only possible if the hearer assumes that the speaker is actually being cooperative and therefore the apparent violation are intended to be meaningful although the speaker may violate these uh, or any of these or more of these manners but the hearer must understand that these are being violated purposefully right and there are two main ways in which the speakers flout these maxims now i have uh, used the words flouting and violating which is used by grice there's a difference that he maintains now, flouting a maxim is generally intentional with a purpose and very overt at the level of what is being said. And it is designed to be noticed by the speakers or the interlocutors, and therefore it is designed to generate a what we know as conversational implicature for particular effect. On the other hand, if you are vi uh, violating a maxim, Right. So it is very, uh, uh, what you can say, unostentatious. It's covert act where, you know, you try to mislead uh, uh, the listener by withholding information or telling something which is lie. It is done intentionally, including useless details in an attempt to obscure or distract the hearer or the other participant. So, um, I've given an example of when flouting a maxim can be done, and it is deliberately very purposefully done when we use uh, sarcasm or irony. It's one of the examples where maxim of quality is flouted. Now, if um, during my class, I'm in a, an exam duty as a teacher, and a student enters in a hurry, uh, gets back, takes the paper and starts writing, and he finds that he doesn't bring, a, he did not bring a pen, and I say, great. Now, I am being sarcastic that time right although its meaning is completely opposite of what i have actually said and even the student realizes that you no know, it is a kind of a sarcasm that the teacher has said that understanding 
is what flouting is. But if I violate a rule or maxim and the speaker is unaware that I am you know, deliberately doing it, we call it violation of the maxim. Uh, there is a case from Julius Caesar where uh, Mark Anthony uh, gives his famous uh, speech where Julius Caesar has been, uh, you know, uh, murdered by his uh, uh, friends and uh, best friend and senators, other senators. And he, Mark Anthony, uh, calls these uh, senators who were responsible for his killing as honorable men eight times, I guess. Now, this repetition of honorable men for the murderers actually gives the impression at the end of the speech and incites the uh, mob that these people are no longer honorable men. So this is how, you know, irony, uh, maximum of quality is deliberately flouted for certain reasons. Now, this flouting and violation of maxims is also done um, uh, to save a face when it comes to politeness theory we see that you know we do have a positive and a negative face and in order to save uh, our positive face we often flout these maxims so even if these maxims do not work they are deliberately flouted they are deliberately flouted to have a conversational implication they are meant to imply something which is not literally written there so we can move on to different ways in which we can think of implicatures, right? So the first uh, kind of implicature that I've mentioned here is particularized conversational implicatures. Now, this particularized, as this word itself suggests, that here the intended inference depends on particular features of the context itself in which this utterance is done you know so the this inference is very directly related to the specific content it's not generalized in nature for example arthur says can you tell me where the post office is and bill replies i'm a stranger here myself bill could have very directly said no i know or i don't know right yes i know or i don't know but he says, I'm a stranger here myself, which means to say that I'm a stranger here and therefore I don't know where it is, right? There is another way in which this conversation might have uh, worked, uh, this response of Bill as I'm a stranger here myself might have meant differently in a different context. Now, when Arthur says, I have just moved to this town, and so far, I'm finding it pretty tedious. I haven't met a single person who is willing to talk about anything except next week's local elections, right? So Arthur is being bored and, you know, there's a small talk that's going on. And Bill, as a mark of this talk, he says, I'm a stranger here myself. So this setting, this context differs here. And the same reply by Bill means implies something else that they are going on some uh, starting a conversation now yeah? so this particularization particular um, meaning which is intended in a specific context of utterance where it is done is known as particularized conversational implicators we move on to the second category uh, which is your generalized conversational implicature. Now, here, the inferences, these are the inferences that we talk about, which do not depend on particular features of the context. Based on context, they are not going to change. But it is instead associated with the kind of proposition that is being expressed. Right. So, the, for example, we would better uh, understand it uh, with this example. The water is warm. Now, this is what it implies is that the water is not hot, neither it's cold, it is warm. The next example is some of the boys played cricket and its implication is that some of the boys, not all, not all of the boys played cricket. The third one is Jeanette has most of the documents. That means Jeanette does not have all the documents, but most of them uh, right 
So here, what I mean to say that, you know, the inference that is drawn is not on one context, but the inference is derived from the word sum, the idea of the word which is warm, the idea of the word which is most. And uh, so it is more about the kind of proposition that is being expressed here. We'll uh, move on. Uh, look at general implications in a bit more detail where we can think of scalar implications. Now, scalar means, you know, we have words which can be marked on a scale. Now, here we are talking about these words which refer to, you know, some points on a scale, on a, a scale of 0 to 10. Maybe there are some points. Now, there are certain words which fall in a continuum. For example, words like, frigid, cold, cool, lukewarm, warm, hot, burning. All these words mean the degree of hotness or coldness is along a continuum, along a scale. Similarly, it's the case with uh, possible words like some, most. These are you know, words referring to non-maximal degree. So these are some of the modifiers like none, some, many, all. Let us see what none, some, many, all we can, how they are related in a continuum. Now all is the stronger, more informative term than many, right? All as a set includes many, right? Now the by the maximum of quantity, many entails at least many, and it also implies not all. So the meaning of many is not or also includes not all. For example, did many of the guests leave? And be it, the speaker says, not all of them, right? This is not the kind of usual response that we get. And therefore, I have marked it with a question mark. But to the same question, did many of the guests leave? Usual reply comes is that yes, all of them. Or yes, in fact, all of them have left. Why is this so? Because of the sense of many, which is not all. Right? Now, these scalar words that we have, um, some of the modifiers like some, many, all, we do have cardinal numbers which behave differently than these uh, sc uh, scalar modifiers. For example, when we say, do you have two children? And the other one replies, no, three, right? So the meaning is exactly no, I, have, I don't have two children, but more than that, an exact figure is three. But if someone replies, Did you, do you have two children? And the reply comes as, yes, in fact, three. Now, that is a bit tricky, and uh, it takes time for us to comprehend what it actually means. Because these numerals that we have, cardinal numbers that we have, like two, you have two readings of this word numerals, like two here, right? This two means at least two, or it could also have another reading like exactly two, right? Which one do we mean to say, depending on our conversation? would change there are these mathematical statements where you know at least readings are not done and round numbers they allow these at least kind of a sense to come in their reading of the word more than the very precise numbers and this is what i mean to say could be very well explained through the uh, next few examples i have mentioned here two plus two these are round numbers. These will not, you know, 2 plus 2 will always be referred to in mathematical uh, equations as not 3. It's a wrong statement, right? Now, the second example that we have here, I have $200 in my bank account, right? This could be true. It could be a statement and very well comprehensible, which uh, if not more. But if I say I have $201.37 in my bank account, it's an exact figure that I'm uh, giving. So you do not have scope for at least kind of a sense to come in, right? Where if not more cannot be added to such sentences like the uh, C1, 
I have $201.37 in my bank account, if not more. This could not be said. But the B sentence can be made. I have $200 in my bank account. Now, one more thing about numerical scales is that these are reversible based on the context, right? But the scalar items, the scalar modifiers that we saw, these cannot be reversed. For example, that, board, that bowler is capable of breaking 100. 100 might also mean that he might even score 150 or he might even score 90, right? Even lesser or even more. The second example, you can survive on 2,000 calories per day or more or even less. But is it possible to say he ate some of your mangoes, if not all? Or is it possible to say he ate some of your mangoes, none of them? That's not possible because it's a scalar term that we are referring to here. Similarly, for the uh, temperature, warmth, coldness, or hotness, we cannot refer uh, to them uh, on these scalar units like this classroom is always warm we cannot say if not hot or if not cool right this classroom is always warm if not hot we cannot say cool in its place right because these are scalar terms and reversals are not possible in scalar terms there is a another instance where uh, indefinite articles can be used to, to imply some things, right? Depending on whether the noun that we are referring to, with, uh, uh, whether that the noun that this article is related to is alienable or inalienable. Let us look at the uh, meaning that this definite article A creates. I walked into a house. And what does it mean? I walked into a house. I entered the house. But a house suggests that this is not my house that I'm referring to right similarly arthur is meeting a woman tonight now a woman suggests that this is not a woman whom arthur knows very well maybe not arthur's wife or a close relative but when i say i broke a finger yesterday because finger is something that is uh, you know uh inalienable part so i broke a finger yesterday the implication is that the finger is my finger and i broke it right so indefinite articles also in some cases are act as you know um, important for implication become very important for implication so where we use uh, you know, indefinite articles and other articles we have to do it very wisely the third form of implicature that we come across is conventional implicatures now, these are uh, implicatures as a part of conventional meaning of a word or construction. They are context free or pragmatically uh, explainable, right? They are not context dependent or explained through its use in language. You have to learn its meaning word by word. There are certain words like therefore, still, even, but, for which we have to understand the inherent meaning of these words. For example, if I use the word still, like he has still not come. So the implication here is that he has not come and he was expected, right? His arrival was very well expected and he has not come. Right? Similarly, when I say I was in Paris in uh, last spring too, this word too carries a meaning by convention. It says that you know, some other people were also present in Paris last spring, and I was also present there. I was one of them. Similar is the case with even, right? Even Bart passed the test. That suggests that Bart was, you know, people did not expect Bart to pass the spec, uh, this particular test. So if he passed, even he passed it. That is the sense that comes. He was the least likely of all persons to have passed the text so these why we say these are conventional uh, um, uh, um, implicature is derived from these words is that you know we have to understand the inherent meaning by the word themselves like therefore still but even 
and many such more. Now, um, before we move on to speech act, I would like to summarize what uh, I would have. I would like to say about conversational implicatures is that you know these conversational implicatures are the paradigm examples of a pragmatic inference. That is meaning which is derived not from the words themselves, always, but from the way those words are used in a particular context. They are an indispensable part of our everyday communication. And in order for a hearer to correctly interpret the part of the speaker's intended meaning, which is not encoded by the words themselves, these implications must be derived in a systematic way based on the principles which are known to us, uh, uh, principles which are known to the participants of the conversation, both the speaker and the hearer. And Grice's idea of cooperative principle and the maxims, they, uh, you know, they give us some basic assumptions about the nature of conversation as a cooperative activity. Now, um, with this um, conversational implicature, there is another idea of speech pack, speech acts as, uh, given by J.L. Austin and CERN, which I would like to briefly mention, because there is something called indirect speech acts, uh, which will be related to the kind of implications that we are, or the sense, or the, um, uh, sorry, the uh, implication that we are talking about. So a brief um, background to the why I've introduced the speech acts. What are these? We it's imperative that I discuss it. Now you know uh, uh, a speech act here is actually considered uh, to be an action that speakers perform by speak uh, by speaking. You know we speak with an intention and with a purpose in mind. So action needs to be done based on what we say like offering thanks or uh, offer greetings, invite people, make requests, give orders. These are actions that we expect to be fulfilled at the end of our utterances. So that way, utterances are said to be performative in nature. right? And this idea of performativity was given by J.L. Austin in 1962. And, uh, Later on, Searle improved on and worked on this particular idea to include indirect speech acts. So all speeches are not considered in pragmatics as speeches themselves, but as speech acts. And in this speech act, there are three kinds of three stages in which you know utterances work, right? When uh, the first act involves locutionary act. The second one is elocutionary act, and the third one is perlocutionary act. Now, these three are uh, you know different way um, progression of a speech act. One speech act comprises of these three acts. Locutionary act is actual words which are uttered, right? It's the actual utterance. The implied meaning of the speaker behind what is being uttered, what he or she says, is the elocutionary part, elocutionary act. And the listener, what inferences the listener draws from what is being actually said is the perlocutionary act. It is the actual effect of the utterance on the listeners. So these three acts pulled together constitute one speech act. Now, in relation, and uh, apart from this, uh, uh, Austin has also given us, based on this idea of um, utterances being performances, he says there are different kinds of performances in the form of directives, commissives, representatives, and such. I will not go into those uh, in detail, but what uh, our focus should be on the nature of speech acts. There, you can have direct speech acts, right? Where the speaker intends what, um, uh, where the speaker's in, uh, intention is directly expressed, it's very overtly expressed. The speaker's intended speech act corresponds to the type of sentence that he or she chooses to say or utter, right? If I say, uh, uh, I want a glass of water, I'm thirsty, this is a direct speech act I am uh, making. 
right? I'm thirsty, I want a glass of water. I want a glass of water, someone is before me and I ask him, right? This is a direct speech act where my intention, intention behind asking someone to get fetch me a glass of water is very clearly uttered. Now, indirect speech acts were worked on in great detail by Searle, and this is where implicators come in. Implicator is built, you know. Here, in indirect speech act, what happens? The speaker's intended speech act do, does not correspond to the sentence type that is cho chosen. For example, you can have you have sentences in the form of declaratives, statements, as a form of command or a request. So, if you wish uh, to order something, you give a command. This is a direct speech act. But you can make a statement and still uh, question someone, or you can make a question and still command someone to do something. That is an indirect speech act. For example, let us take this example of. Uh, uh, Ravi, uh, someone calls Ravi and says, Ravi, can you close the window? Right now, this is a question interrogative sentence which is uh, utterances, utterance. But Ravi, can you close the window? Seems to be like a command, right? So, the intended speech of the speaker here is not in the form of interrogation or a question, but the sentence type is completely different. The uh, uh, speaker intends Ravi to go and close the window. It's a command, order. Right? So this is an indirect speech act. Now, uh, the same thing can be changed. For example, Ravi, can you please close the window? And this question sentence type changes to a request. Right? The action which is required at the end uh, from, on the part of Ravi is different. It becomes a request. So what we see is that Indirect speech acts are conversational implicators, and their uh, interpretation can be explained in Grecian terms. But in addition, they are often partly conventionalized as well. So uh, a speech act for, uh, is an action that speakers perform by speaking. And languages typically have grammatical ways of distinguishing these sentence types or moves corresponding to at least three basic speech acts, like making statements, commands, and questions. And uh, when the speaker's intended speech act or illocutionary force corresponds to the sentence type, that is, a direct speech act is performed. And uh, in addition, the declarative sentence type is general. There are some declarative sentences type. Uh, they are a special class of direct speech acts. We call explicit performatives. I will not discuss that in detail. When the speaker's intended speech act is, uh, you know, does not correspond to the sentence type that is chosen, an indirect speech act occurs. And that is where you know, indirect speech acts are seen to be part of these conversational implicators. And uh, a lot of research is going on into this indirect indirect speech acts. And uh, these inter can be better interpreted in the light of Grecian's cooperative principle and the kinds of uh, four maxims that Bryce offers, a lot of uh, improvements, um, revisions have been done on you know, Grecian's maxims as well. Levinson comes out uh, that um, uh, combining these four maxims and uh, uh, making two maxims out of these. So there are certain, um, you know, uh, open, um, more, uh, discussions on Grecian improvements, uh, people might say, or different um, uh, discussions uh, by Levinson uh, for, you know, the way maxims can be, uh, you know, uh, used, how maxims are uh, not all the time agreed upon and uh, um, expressed, but they are being flouted. They are being flouted deliberately because an implicator is being done. So to imply, you know, we often do not speak very directly. There are many 
few people who are very direct in uh, their statements and we often in our everyday language whatever our languages be often go for indirect speech acts so the role of implicature becomes very powerful as locutionary acts as well thank you everyone Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, so that was a very informative session, and uh, I think the participants also have, uh, you know, agreed that they are, uh, you know, they find it very, you know, interesting and informative also. So uh, the chat box is filled with a lot of questions, ma'am. So if you just permit me, I think I can read out some of the questions for you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. So I think we can. Uh, Just start with a question from uh, Gulshan Ishtiak. Uh, so the question is, how conversations lead to cognition? That is the question. Mark. Ma'am, am I audible? Uh, yes, yes. I yeah. How conversations lead to cognition? That is the question. Uh, you know, uh, when we consider it from the point of view of implications, now where, what I uh, got from the question is that in a conversation, how do we realize, uh, how do the other participants in, of the conversation come to know the meaning? Right? How does cognition take part? Is that what is the uh, sense that comes out? So, you know, I mentioned it in the beginning itself that, you know, uh, this is uh, possible when, uh, you know, we share the common uh, speech community, right? Now, the moment context comes in, uh, you know, the context uh, in which the speakers are involved. Now, this is also a case where, you know, if we do not belong, uh, if the communication is not happening, there's a, something called a cross-cultural communication. So there is our chances of this conversation and the meaning that comes out of it, inference of the meaning. Might there might be some misunderstandings, cross-cultural in cross-cultural communications. That is why I mentioned that you know, for this meaning making, it is important uh, to consider the you know speech community that we are a, pa a part of, uh, or the participants are a part of in the co uh, conversation. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, so the next question, the participants also can uh, please unmute and uh, ask questions directly to ma'am. So meanwhile, while you're getting ready, I'm just going to read the next question from Aravindan. What causes a pragmatic language disorder? Are EFL or ESL children prone to be affected by this disorder? Uh, can, I, can you please read it again? Yeah. Sorry. yeah. Yeah, yes, yes. ma'am, I'll read it again. What causes a pragmatic language disorder? Are EFL or ESL children prone to be affected by this disorder? As I have uh, said in this uh, first answer to this question also, you know, it's more of cross-cultural uh, communication, misunderstanding or disorder that might result in right in an efl uh, situation where what is being implied you know whether some uh, the uh, maxim is being uh, you know flouted we are not able to get it right where this cooperation does not work hello 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 i guess yes. Martin, yes. i was saying something oh uh, yes yes ma'am Sir, uh, I think uh, there was a question from someone. Uh, yes, sir, sir. I guess Patil, sir, is saying something. Yes, Patil, sir, yes. Hello. Yeah, good evening. And thank you very much for a wonderful talk on a very important topic. Uh, that is uh, pragmatics. Now, I have a little question. Are you? Am I audible, ma'am? Yes, sir, you are audible. OK. I'm Zaidan Patil, and I'm, I'm heading the heading the 
Pune chapter of Eltai. Yes, I have a question for you, ma'am. Yes. Uh, let me first of all congratulate you. You did a wonderful job. You simplified a very difficult topic. So we are so grateful I'm still to you new that. to this uh, field. I have uh, recently started yeah. working on anyway. it. So there might be some, you know. Anyway. Yeah. Anyway, no problem. So uh, I would like to give an uh, give an example from Shakespeare's Othello, right? And I hope everyone listening to me and listening to you is familiar with Shakespeare's Othello. What happens in that play? It's a domestic tragedy. So in the initial scenes in the play, Iago and Rodrigo are talking about Desdemona's wedding, Desdemona's marriage with Othello. And they go and approach Desdemona's father, Brabantio, and they talk about uh, things in a very indirect manner. For example, they say to Desdemona's father, uh, we are sorry to tell you that you are going to have black grandchildren. We are sorry to say to you, that uh, your daughter has become a beast with two backs, right? So this is one instance. The second one is throughout the play, Iago uh, makes up stories of illegitimate <coughs> relationship between Desdemona and Othello. So uh, he creates stories, he produces stories, he produces evidence or proofs. That is second example. The third one is, uh, you know, Tristram Shandy and uh, Ulysses, James Joyce's Ulysses and Lawrence Stern's Tristram Shandy. In these two novels, certain pages are left blank. There is nothing printed on those pages. So, which are uh, which three maxims, in your opinion, are flouted in these three cases? Number one, Rodrigo and Iago approach Desdemona's father, and they talk about uh, Desdemona and Othello becoming a beast with two backs. And they talk about the possibility of Rodrigo having uh, black grandchildren. This is one. The second one is Iago concocts or makes up uh, stories. He, you know, he produces, he concocts evidence or proof of illegitimate, illicit relationship between Desdemona and uh, between sorry Desdemona and Cassio. And the third one is from Tristram Shandy by Lawrence Stern and. Ulysses by James Joyce. In these two novels, the authors leave certain pages, uh, certain paragraphs deleted, or they leave certain pages blank. So in my opinion, these three instances are instances of violation, or to use your word, flouting of three maxims. So which three maxims, in your opinion, have been flouted in these three instances? So when so it, uh, I would try to answer. Uh, the first one when uh, you know, Rodrigo uh, Niago talk about uh, talk about Desdemona. I think uh, the manner, the maxim of manner. They are you know that maxim of manner is being you know uh, flouted. Okay. And okay. when it comes to uh, which was the second I one? Yeah, goes. Yeah, goes. Making of... up stories and uh, yeah, you know, yeah. I think uh, this quality, that truthfulness, that is being flouted. Okay. 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 Uh, for the you. third one, sir, I'll have to think about it. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, Lawrence Stern in Tristram Shandy and James mm -hmm. Joyce in Ulysses leave certain pages blank, blank with no information there. So, in my opinion, I may be wrong. In my opinion, the uh, this is an example, or this is an instance of, uh, you know, flouting of, uh, flouting of the quantity maxim because they are not providing information which we need in order for us to be able to understand the thing in a holistic manner. Right, and so, so yeah, 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 please. you are right, and um, I am uh, reminded of this waiting for Godo. Okay. Even, yeah. even that text, we have quite a few examples where we can mm -hmm. look at these maxims, which Grecian maxims, which are flouted or deliberately. Okay. We'll okay. Send those as well. Yeah. Thank you. Thank You're you. Right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Pati sir. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, the next question is uh, from Ruth Phillips. Does silence and pauses also come under these uh, implications? Yes. Okay, I think, uh, yeah, yes. 
Yes, they do. Uh, but I said that, you know, uh, these paralinguistic features that we have, the silences, the pauses, we have mm -hmm. deliberately, I didn't discuss, uh, but yes, they do. Silences, gestures, even sign language for that matter. Our silences, our facial expressions, our gestures, they do convey a lot of uh, information. So definitely, they do imply. Uh, but uh, this was uh, uh, beyond the scope of my discussion. That's why I didn't discuss it. Otherwise, yes, they do. They do imply a lot. OK, thank you, ma'am. I think uh, there is a participant who, who wants to ask a question. Uh, uh, Sony Glory, I think you can uh, unmute and ask questions directly. <laughs> Ms. Sony, are you there? Yes, please go ahead, Sony. You can ask questions, ma'am. Yes, Anandi, ma'am. Sorry to interrupt. Yes. I think I think we could uh, conclude the Q and A session, ma'am. It's almost All right. time. Yeah. All right. Can All can right. I just can I ask another question very briefly and quickly, ma'am? Yes, yes, sir, you can. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Uh, Ma'am, uh, this is a question uh, for, the, for the Honorable Speaker, for Arpana ji. Uh, do you think we can carry out an analysis of Mr. Bean episodes or Charlie Chaplin novel, Charlie Chaplin movies or films? Do you think it's possible for us to carry out an analysis, speech act analysis, or pragmatic analysis of Charlie Chaplin movie? or Laurel and Hardy movie, or... Yes, sir, uh, definitely, it's possible. Because there is no language. There is no verbal language. It's possible. But, yes, yeah. sir, definitely it's possible. OK, OK, thank you. Bye. Back to you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, thank you, participants. So it was uh, wonderful uh, being uh, here with you all. Thank you. So uh, uh, I by now hand over the session to the host uh, uh, and my friend, uh, Dr. Lena. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, ma'am. I would like to thank our resource person of the session, Dr. Ratanaja, and also uh, the moderator, uh, Dr. Anandi. Thank you for the session, ma'am. And uh, now before we wind up the session, I would just like to make an announcement that uh, the next, that is the 104th uh, webinar, will be held on uh, 30th october and i now request uh, mr joseph to share the poster of the webinar please yes so here you can find the details here participants so this is would this would be an interactive session it is an interaction with the national award teachers and the resource persons are uh, Ms. Meenakshi Goswami, Principal CNS Higher Secondary School, and Ms. Janus Jacob, uh, Teacher, Kendra Vidyalaya Trishur, from Trishur, and uh, Mr. Om Prakash uh, from Government Excellence Higher Secondary School. Hope your participation, um, participants. Uh, thank you all once again for this wonderful session. Thank you all. Meet you in the next session. Thank you.